Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by U.S. Air Force veteran Gene Kranz, who you may know best for his role at NASA during many of the critical early missions, including the Gemini and, of course, the Apollo programs. And Mr. Kranz, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much, and it's a uh, really great pleasure and privilege to be here at the American Veterans Center uh, celebrating with uh, coming young leaders of America, of our nation. Absolutely. A lot of young cadets and yes, ROTC from all over the all over the country are here. Uh, let's talk about where you come from. Where were you born and raised? I was born in uh, Toledo, Ohio in uh, 1933. I had two older sisters, one 10 years old, another one five. And basically, I uh, actually grew up in, uh, in South Toledo. My father was a World War I veteran. And basically, uh, he would get together the family every night to listen to the radio that was on top of the uh, refrigerator there, listen to Edward R. Merle reporting from London. He was reporting from London during the Blitz. Sometimes he described the he was down in one of the subways down there, described the people in the subway and what was going on. Other times he'd just get on top of a building and watch the fires and the bombing from, so it was a... Uh, Time to grow up. I didn't understand what was really going on. My father basically talked about another world war. And shortly I would learn it firsthand because when my father died, we lived next to the American Legion. And uh, the post down there basically requested my mother to, if, they had, uh, if we had any spare bedrooms and uh, to house the soldiers and sailors and airmen that were in transit. And this was good good for my mother because it provided a source of income. Uh, but it also provided the same for myself and my sisters that basically uh, we learned really of the greatest generation from the greatest generation. And it was, I look back at that time and I'd say this was an inspirational time and it basically set uh, the framework for my life from that day forward. You were enamored not only by the, the vets that you came into contact with, but uh, from following the war and pilots in particular that inspired your service. So when did you join the service? Well, it was uh, a back up just a little bit from that because uh, uh, I uh, went through Toledo Central Catholic High School and I had uh, three teachers there and they knew I was carrying two jobs to support my mother after the war. So they basically uh, coached me for and prepared me for the Annapolis entrance examination. Uh, I basically made the grade, got the appointment, but I failed the physical, unfortunately. That was really a, a tough because I wanted to be a naval aviator. I wanted to do, you know, you talk about Jimmy Doodle taking 25s off the carrier deck. I wanted to be a fighter pilot coming off the carrier deck and uh, uh, winning the battle. That inspiration carried me once I'd been turned down to continue to look for uh, service. And I went to a small aviation college in East St. Louis, Illinois, Parkside College. And this was really my field of dreams because they had uh, cross cinder runways down there. They were still flying the PT-17s. They had a few Taylor craft. And I got my engineering degree there. I got the aircraft and power plant license. And I got my first 10 hours flying time. And from that time on, from time on I was hooked. I was a ROTC graduate there. And uh, while I was waiting for my uh, introduction, beginning of my uh, pilot training class, 56M, to start, I worked at McDonnell Aircraft for about 10 months. And there, next to my mother, I found the most other most inspirational leader in my life. His name was Harry Carroll. And he was a World War II B-17 pilot. He flew with 15th Air Force out of Italy and as his first mission as co-pilot, once he got shipped overseas, was to Plessy. And anybody who is familiar with aviation history knows the history of the raids in Plessy. There's some of the most expensive to aircraft and aircrew members in the entire war over Europe. Uh, basically, uh, he moved to the 8th Air Force for the D-Day, uh, flew many of the uh, uh, missions, basically in support of the uh, the invasion. And then uh, what after uh, 
Berlin and Hamburg and the rest of it. Basically, he was what I would say was a Renaissance man. Uh, he came back and got his engineering uh, degree through Washington, Washington University. But basically, he was an inventor. He's looking after aviation, aviation safety. Uh, he wrote poetry during uh, preparation for many of the missions. It was after seeing me sitting in the cockpit, and he'd write uh, about the clouds in the sky as a playground for uh, for angels. And you know, it was just interesting to be around a man. He was a big scout leader, led the Grand Portage canoe trip across the Canadian border. So he was, to a great extent, the father I never had. And uh, he was inspiration when I... Uh, Completed flight training, my first cross country was to go visit Harry and introduce, introduce him to my instructor. And I stayed with him all through my life. And later on, I uh, got into the air show business after retired and flew B 17 Flying Fortress. And I could visualize Harry at the, up in the cockpit, at the controls of that aircraft. And uh, it was uh, just an uh, absolute uh, dream to live his dream and feel uh, together with him. In fact, many times in the space program, I would be speaking to my people, preparing for a mission. And after the fact, I'd listen to myself, and I think that's Harry talking. It isn't Gene Kranz. It's Carol. It's what he gave me. This was, uh, this was the entrance. I uh, entered the Air Force, went through uh, standard pre-flight at Lackland Air Force Base. And this was uh, still at a time, I don't know what they do with uh, young lieutenants nowadays, but basically, after about uh, two weeks there, basically I was given to one of the training instructors, and he and I would meet a bus coming in from Chicago with a whole bunch of draftees, and we would introduce these young draftees to the Air Force, and in the process, the TI would introduce me to what uh, being an officer was all about. So it was a uh, great time to grow up and a great time to join the Air Force. I wanted to get into Korea, but unfortunately, or fortunately, Basically, the air war had ended, but basically I still dreamed of flying and fighting and becoming an ace. What do you think was most beneficial from your Air Force years when you joined NASA and became a leading official in NASA? What was most valuable from your Air Force time? There were several things. First of all, I got shipped over to Korea and basically I became a flight leader over there. It was basically now taking what I believed about leadership and applying it uh, to three young uh, pilot graduates uh, that were in my flight and teach them the business to fly and fight and survive and that kind of a environment over there. I think the second thing was, it's hard to describe, but several of our instructors out at Nellis, I went through fighter weapons school, they would really talk about uh, visualization, be able to position yourself, the other aircraft, be able to put this whole thing into a picture and basically establish your next move and anticipate what the other guys were going to be doing. So it was really the, the process of visualization and air combat maneuvering that I think were very important in really making me feel comfortable in a very difficult environment that I found myself in many times during the, during the space program. So I think that was, that was a major part of it. The other part of it was, uh, basically becoming a young leader and uh, being willing to step up to the accountability that leadership demands. What year did you join NASA? That's a, a different, that's a different long story. But after I come <laughs> back from, after I came back from Korea, I became a civilian flight test engineer in the B-52. And basically at that time, they, uh, they had they determined the Soviet Union had a ser service air missile capability. And basically I was sort of given the Bombay. I owned the Bombay of the B-52 to develop the technologies and the systems that would allow that aircraft to penetrate Soviet airspace. And it was a uh, really great uh, program because there we had McDonnell with the quail missile, we had General Electric with the JD-5, we had other people, Sandia would want to put stuff in the Ford Bombay. So it was a question of, of working with a relatively large, diverse group of people against the uh, time constant of getting the aircraft Engine start in time to get on range. So it was basically making risk-based decision. Is it is it safe to fly this flight with the squawks, the open items we have, and convincing not only myself but basically leading other people to say, "Yeah, we'll part. We'll be part of that decision. We'll sign up for you. So let's go." Ahead. 
So uh, basically, uh, the uh, flying was uh, very instrumental in that experience in the B-52. But then when it, the program finished, I was looking for a job. I could go out to work at Edwards Air Force Base with McDonnell. Uh, they're taking the F-4 uh, Phantom II out there. I had an opportunity to go up work with General Dynamics up in uh, Omaha, learn about rockets. But I saw an advertisement in Aviation Week magazine. And this said they're forming a space task group and they're looking for qualified engineers to determine the feasibility of putting an American in space. Uh, gee, that sounds like a pretty interesting thing. So I sent in an application, didn't hear anything for uh, several weeks. I, we had two young kids at that time. It was starting to get sort of antsy. The program's over. Uh, we're going to need some money. And uh, uh, I got a phone call. They said, are you still uh, interested in joining the space task group? And I said, yes. And they said, when can you report? I gave them a reporting date. I reported to the Langley Research Center. I was never interviewed for the job. Uh, sat in basically a bullpen for about two weeks. And a gentleman comes up, taps me on the shoulder and says, I'm Chris Kraft. You're working for me now. I want you to go down to the Cape, write a countdown, write some mission rules. And when you're through, give me a call and we'll launch. That was the first Redstone launch. The legendary Chris Kraft. Yeah. So you go to the Cape and you obviously did pretty well. Well, it was, it was yes and yes and no. It was very interesting because in the process of going to the Cape, you had to figure out, I could put the piece together. I knew there had to be a spacecraft that's over at Hangar S and you go down the launch pad. There's a, there's a booster down there. I knew a bit about range safety from Holloman where we were. So I could go over and find range safety. So it was a question of pulling these people together and then get to know the people in Mercury Control who had the telemetry and the command and the communications and all this kind of stuff. And basically pull this into a package against the time and write that countdown. Well, the good news was I got the countdown written. Uh, we then got down to launch day. We set the firing command. The engine ignited this great big puff of smoke. And then the television came down. The rocket was still on the launch pad. We had launched the escape rocket. And that was what now up to about uh, 1,500 feet. All the senators and congressmen ran for cover because this was coming back to Earth. So... My uh, first uh, launch wasn't too swift. <laughs> but they kept you, obviously. Chris Kraft was an incredibly gifted engineer. And he was getting a job to form a place called Mission Control, Mercury Control in those days. Define what everybody does. And when I arrived out the Cape, several of the people were starting writing down a job description. This systems guy, and this is a network guy, and this is what a flight director does, and and uh, I'd been through that routine in the Air Force. I'd been through that routine at Holloman and flight test. I knew about the communications. I could communicate based on my Air Force experience. So I sort of picked up the uh, business of providing his voice out to the Mercury Network. And remember, this is a time before uh, satellite communications. We did not have direct communications, except for those stations that were within the continental United States, United States Bermuda, and Hawaii. And from then on, it was by submarine cable and then by HF point to point. So most of the work we did in communicating was through teletype messages. So you'd write the teletype message out, an operator would type it out, it'd be received at Kano, Nigeria, or Zanzibar. Paper would be torn off, handed to a controller out there. The controller would read it and say, oh, I wonder what he wants to do. So this was, this was sort of the nature of the beast at that time. And I was gluing that thing together for craft. And that was something he needed to do because he had to worry about the spacecraft, the crew, those kinds of things. But I made sure that all of the functions necessary to support the mission were operating. And uh, by the time we got to the uh, John Glenn mission, he had named me the assistant flight director. And then from then on, all the way through the rest of the missions, it was uh, basically an a incredible relationship based on trust. He trusted me to do my part of the job while he could do his part of the job. And it was a, a relationship that was very important because Mercury was not easy. We had problems in the John Glenn mission. Scotty Carpenter was out of fuel by the time he got around to the retrofire point. Wally Shara, the uh, third uh, orbital mission, it was pretty smooth. But then we got to Gordon Cooper. It seemed like every electrical system in the spacecraft was failing. But Mercury was sort of our uh, training ground. Uh, it was our boot camp for what space was all about. So by the time that we got into the Gemini program, two-man spacecraft, 
And this was the precursor for all of the kinds of things we need to do for the lunar landing. By the way, we had just uh, launched Alan Shepard two weeks earlier when President Kennedy made his speech. When he made those words, we choose to go to the moon, we choose to go to the moon in this decade. I was all for it because I wanted to beat the Russians. I wanted to get and maintain and establish supremacy in space. And it was, it was the inspiration was uh, really a challenge to sit down and say, we will put this together and we're going to win this battle for the high ground. And that's what my mission became. Not as much to get them in, but to get the high ground that I believe our nation needed. So you became flight director during the later stages of the Gemini series. I was made flight director at the beginning of Gemini. Beginning of Gemini. Yeah, okay. I was the uh, second mission. The first mission was a three-orbit mission with Gus Grissom. And basically, by the time we got to the Gemini 4 mission, basically, I was one of three flight directors. Myself, Kraft, and John Hodge, an Englishman, who has an interesting history because he was a young boy who grew up in England during the Blitz. And his fam that's when they separated the families, put the children out in the countryside. The father stayed in London. And uh, John became an engineer over there. He basically was training for the RAF. He was flying Tiger Moth. And uh, he saw an opportunity to come over to the States and work with Avro of Canada. And Avro at that time built the world's top performing aircraft, the Avro Aero. And John was the flight test engineer of the number six aircraft that was with a big engine, the Orenda engine, which was uh, going to crack Mach 2. So this was a interesting, I had myself, Kraft, and Hodge were the first three of the flight directors in there. And we sort of set the, I won't say the pace or the stage, because Kraft wanted each one of us, he trusted each one of us to basically accomplish our role during the course of the mission, but he wasn't looking for clones. He wanted to look for people who were not only capable of leadership, but basically addressing the challenge every step forward as he moved into space. So that uh, my job and John's Hodge was to basically say, okay, we're sort of looking ahead here. And this is what we must do. This is how we're going to prepare. This is the kind of team we need, et cetera. So it was a, uh, a remarkable time in space. And I think in our nation's history, as we developed the capabilities we needed to go to Apollo. And of course, uh, we'll get to Apollo 11 and Apollo 13, but the program started with Apollo 1 fire. And I read uh, you were actually getting ready to take your wife out on a date because you just yes, had another baby. And when you found out that this testing had gone horribly wrong, tell us about that. Yes, the uh, Apollo 1 fire with uh, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. We had worked with Gus and Ed in the Mercury and Gemini program. Roger was a rookie. Uh, we believed and we heard that he was basically a naval aviator who had flown and got the uh, pictures over Cuba during the missile crisis. And the day preceding it, there's two series of tests, what they call the plugs-in test, where you don't transfer power internal to the spacecraft and then the plugs out. I had done the plugs-in test, which was... Uh, uh, eight-hour test that basically ran almost 30 hours. And basically, we turned around at the end of that test, took about an eight-hour break, and then I came back in to do the uh, early uh, test and countdown work for the uh, plugs out test. And basically, I had it up to around noon when I handed over to Kraft in mission control. And uh, throughout that afternoon, the various problems and procedures and communications and life support system right on down the line. And I was at home prepared. I was taking my wife out, just had to get a break. And uh, we're all set to go out. And a neighbor next door who worked in space was pounding on the door. And he says, uh, they had an accident on the launch pad. They think the crew's dead. And they didn't, they didn't take anything to get me going. And I was en route to uh, mission control. And they had already secured the building. There was no way to get in, but I knew ways to get in, basically through the freight entrance down there. And so basically I managed to get into mission control up into the operations room. Basically uh, witnessed firsthand the impact upon the young people that were in the mission control team. I had lost a couple of pilots in my uh, squadron when we were over in Korea. Uh, Kraft had worked flight test. He was familiar with accidents. 
And it was really a question of uh, carrying this young group of people through. Uh, very traumatic. It was traumatic in many ways because if you take a look, we had not only lost a crew, but there was a good chance that the program was now under great threat and we wouldn't be able to write the words mission accomplished on the words that President Kennedy gave us. But more so, it was a really a question of loss of our teenage years. We now had to mature into a tough and competent flight control team. And basically at that time, as the division chief, deputy division chief of flight control, and I addressed the people uh, three days after, basically uh, so I'm assuming the responsibility for our part of that failure. Because all through that day, uh, the teams of mission control, flight director Chris Kraft could have called a halt. Uh, crew could have called a halt. People at the launch pad did, but nobody spoke up and said, hey, stop, things aren't right. And it was uh, the context of the talk I gave to my people that I think got them back on track. And I think we assumed responsibility for our part of that failure. And we didn't bother searching for who was responsible. We just assumed we were responsible. And this, I think, was true throughout the good parts of the agency, particularly in upper management. And they made a lot of management changes. At that time, I became the division chief of flight controller, got the which brought us out of responsibilities. Kraft moved out of the flight director job into the center director. So I moved into a role that was principally as a chief of the flight directors, chief of the flight control division. And it was to basically execute uh, the mission assignment we had been given by President Kennedy. It's, I think, quintessentially American that the program did continue mm -hmm. with the proper safeguards and protocols in place. And then we got a series of Apollo missions, and we could go through all of them, but sadly, time doesn't permit. But let's hit some of the ones. Apollo 8 is the first one to orbit the moon, and that's just before Christmas, and the astronauts are reading Genesis 1. What kind of a moment was that? That was, uh, I was fortunate because as division chief, I elected to work only the odd-numbered missions. So this was great sitting behind the flight directors, watching and feeling and let that emotion sink in. And uh, I think principally, I think it was the most beautiful Christmas Eve I'd ever experienced in my life. And it was almost like uh, God's gift, NASA's gift to America in a very troubled period of time because uh, we had the civil rights movement, the environmental movement was going on. Assassinations. The protests year, yeah. for and against Vietnam. That decade we had had three assassinations. Uh, so it was a time where maybe we started a healing process. And I think very our nation very much needed it. And I had a lot of people that uh, were Air Force detailees, and basically they were over in Vietnam. But to a great extent, I considered that mission uh, their mission. So then Apollo 9 and 10, which don't get a lot of attention, mm -hmm. are testing out the, the lunar module, correct? And mm -hmm. Apollo 10 was basically a dress rehearsal from what I've read. So that brings us, of course, to Apollo 11, Let's start with the, the, the crew. Were Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins handpicked for the landing, or were they, were they just the next ones up, or how did it work? No, I don't know how the selection process went. Uh, I had flown with uh, Armstrong and Aldrin, my first flight as flight director. They were my Capcoms. I had flown with Neil in the Gemini mission where I brought him down in the West Pacific after a uh, spacecraft emergency there. He was, the what I would say, the leading pilot astronaut of that period of time. We had a lot of good ones. They were all good. They were good in the stick. But Neil always reminded me of a college professor, soft-smoking, wanted to think things over right or not on the line. But you put a stick in his hand in an aircraft, the X-15 or the uh, lunar module simulation, keep the trainer, LLTV that we had in there. Put him in that cockpit, and boy, he knows what to do. He's got some kind of a focus, intense, upon the action in the hand, and he has the intensity to finish anything he starts. Uh, Buzz was a very smart guy. Uh, he worked on mission control, and he was, I think, to some, some extent, the key to the beginning of the Apollo program. But he was the first real astronaut pilot 
who mastered extravehicular operations. And that was in the Gemini 12 mission, which is the final mission before it was scheduled to start Apollo. So Buzz was a, uh, I won't say a mechanic. Neil Armstrong was the plumber. But basically these two were the perfect match. And Mike Collins, I like Mike, uh, because he had a grasp of his job in the solo command module. And that basically, we worked with him in several of the lunar modules. You get off the surface, you get in proper orbit, he'd have to perform a rescue. And he, he mastered so many skills necessary to provide solo operation of that spacecraft. It was made for three. Right hand pilot, co-pilot kind of arrangement with guy in the middle occasionally flipping a switch. But the Mike was basically uh, capable, the most capable probably solo pilot uh, next to maybe Ken Mattingly, the two were great solo pilots in the command module. Let's take you into the mission now. And of course, one of the things that we know about is how low the fuel was running as they approached the lunar surface. Um, two quick questions on this. First of all, you talk about the leadership it takes to run mission control under times of great stress. But what is going through your mind when you hear this countdown going on? The thing that was most interesting about the descent was what we did not know. There were three major problems lurking that made me as flight director come very close to not only delaying but scrubbing the first attempted descent. Uh, we had massive communications problems, and there was a ground rule written that the flight director is basically the crash recorder, that basically he had to make sure that we had enough data in mission control such we had an accident, we could reconstruct what happened, the program could go on. It was purely a judgment call, how much is enough? Uh, the second thing was, was uh, basically a uh, procedural issue uh, related with the separation between two spacecraft. The crew did not fully vent the pressure in the tunnel between the two spacecrafts. And when they separated, it was like a champagne cork popping out of a bottle. It basically was like a maneuver. The spacecraft had been performed, but we didn't know it had happened. So this is going to change our trajectory. It's going to change the point at which we start the descent to the surface of the moon. The third one was uh, one that was uh, that almost killed us because the uh, computer started having a series of uh, basically fault downs. It would fault down from normal operation to pure guidance and control. And this is because a problem had been recognized early in the program on the interface between the limb guidance computer and the rendezvous radar. And then the rendezvous radar wasn't in use, but the computer saw it powered up and was interrogating it, looking for data. Well, the computer normally ran at about 80% CPU, which is 80% loaded. Asking this radar for data, which wasn't coming in, add another 15%. So we're about 95% loaded in the computer, but we do not have any measurements in this ground. We don't know. And whenever the crew asked, what was that alarm about? It folded down into pure guidance and control. So the three problems that were lurking, the first one, communications really got us in the process of getting ready to give the go-no-go. -no -go. I made the go-no-go -no -go to go down to the surface of the moon based on a gut feeling that my team would solve the problem. And we would continue down for five minutes. And if we didn't, then we would have to abort the landing. That was one. Second thing was the trajectory thing was basically we're moving now to the point where we're landing in a very rugged landing site. The impact to me was the fact that we're probably going to use more fuel down there, but don't sweat it. That wasn't the case because Neil Armstrong being the perfect pilot, Saw those computer alarms happening, and like a pilot, his first job is to fly that airplane. And basically, he doesn't have an ejection seat, can't get out. If a problem occurs when he's going down, he has to basically fly that spacecraft out of there using the backup guidance system right on the line. So Neil's busy flying that thing, and he isn't looking up to see where his landing site should be, which is then going to cause him problems later on. So as this, we go down through this descent, we're fighting communication problem, we're fighting navigation problem, we're waiting for the landing radar to come in. This is all taking time as we get down close to the surface. Neil Final looks out and says, aha, I see a landing site out there, but there's a big crater around there. Am I going to overfly the crater or going to land shortly? No, I'm going to fly over. In the process of doing this, he used fuel. He's maneuvering around trying to find a good space. 
the dust is blowing with him, so he can't determine what it is basically motion is. He has to pick out a big rock. Says, aha, I know that isn't blowing away, so I'm going to use that as a reference. And basically, he gets down to the surface, and we start to count down the seconds of fuel remaining. And basically, we start off at what they call low level. I had 120 seconds. That's thing here. It's total communication, silence, and mission control. There's only one person talking. Basically, my control and propulsion guy is counting seconds of fuel. 60 seconds, 30 seconds. About the time he says fifth, we recognize the crew has just landed. Then we hear the words, Houston Tranquility Base here, the Eagles landed. And the viewing room behind me erupts and the people are clapping and applauding. But we got to go through now a series of two hours addressing and looking at the system, what it calls stay no stay decision. That these were two minutes after landing, eight minutes after landing, two hours after landing. And if a problem occurred, if we got off at two minutes, eight minutes, two hours, the limb could provide an active rendezvous with the command and service module. So these were times while the world is celebrating, we're working that spacecraft. And uh, as I told the audience this morning, I just wish we could go back and do it one more time, one of this time celebrate with the world <laughs> that we had just landed. You were busy doing your job yeah. and making sure all the math was working out. The calmness in the voice of both people, as Armstrong was talking and uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the man calling out the, the amount of time left, just the demeanor is, is just amazing in that. A few days later, uh, they returned safely to the Earth. So you and your colleagues had made JFK's dream come true. Yes, we did. Mission what did, accomplished. What did that mean? It's interesting, the, uh, as we finally finished the last two hours, we gave the final stay, and the EVA flight control team was standing by reading gun. I wrote, mission accomplished in the log. And that was uh, when we had the Apollo 1 fire. I think all of us, myself, many of us, had made a pledge to the crew of Apollo 1, to President Kennedy, that we would complete what they set out to do. And we did. Well, like you said, you were in charge of the odd-numbered mission. So let's go to the next odd-numbered <laughs> mission. And so that's April of 1970 with Apollo 13, which, uh, as most folks know, was supposed to be a lunar mission. What exactly went wrong? Uh, basically, we had an explosion in the oxygen tank, too, uh, that basically uh, blew the top off the tank. Uh, basically, the pressurization caused many of the valves, and the shock caused many of the valves in the system to uh, close, change states. Uh, basically, it was like a blowtorch. So it blew the side of the spacecraft off. When the side came off the spacecraft, the area surrounding the spacecraft was clouded with debris of explosion and frozen particles of oxygen. And we did not know an explosion had occurred at that time. I went through three frames of mind. The first one was uh, when the crew got a, we got a problem. We'd look at the day. We'd seen master alarms before, and I said, okay, easy problem, we'll solve it after we put the crew to sleep. Then one of my controllers said they had a pretty big bang associated with that. And I remembered a similar occurrence and words in the uh, Apollo 9 mission. So then I moved into, a, okay, let's proceed much more cautiously, more carefully here. And then when Lovell was looking outside the window and said, hey, I see something bending, I think it's our oxygen. Then it became a mission of survival. And uh, from then on, the, uh, the real challenge was to address turning a two-day spacecraft using a lifeboat. First of all, I'd go back, because we had to make the decision, what are we going to do? I was the flight director in charge then. I wanted to buy time. And the way to buy time was to let the spacecraft coast onward towards the moon and then find some way to accelerate our return journey. So that was the first thing, buy time. Secondly, was to get my team focused now upon the challenge of turning this two-day spacecraft into about a four- to five-day spacecraft. And that we did basically later on. And that was to hand over the responsibility and start this mission sequence. We started with four flight control teams normally during the mission. Basically, my team was pulled offline to work the problem and show up only when we had answers. The other three teams would continue to operate in eight-hour shifts, basically uh, keeping the mission going, following through in the instructions, getting more data for us, etc. Uh, 24 hours after explosion, 
how my team came back then on the console. Uh, we were going to perform a what we call a get home fast maneuver. We we're going to use the lunar module engines that we would have used to land on the moon. Well, this time we're going to use it to increase our forward speed by roughly about a thousand feet per second, cut it off. And then we power down the spacecraft to a survival level. And then we got to figure out, we got a series of problems now, a space, part of it, spacecraft freezing up, the other getting too hot. So we had to develop a barbecue maneuver to spin the spacecraft perfectly to the sun's rays. Uh, we had basically a, uh, a cruise going to suffocate due to carbon dioxide poisoning. Uh, we had to invent uh, some way. We used a cylindrical water scrubber in the lunar module. We had run out of those. So the carbon dioxide partial pressure is building up, becoming very toxic to the crew. So I have to use some of the square scrubbers that are in the old command module that we're not using and adapt them to fit into the round hole. Uh, then it's basically get some rest for my people, then come up with a series of checklists we need to perform the get home fast maneuver. Uh, basically to do the power up, get ready for reentry. We had to do an emergency maneuver. We didn't have any uh, computer display system. And we had to learn to maneuver and using the sun, or excuse me, the earth as a reference. Uh, and basically using scribe lines and two telescopes we had in there. So we had to invent all kinds of workarounds to address every problem that we saw. But the team was, by this time, we were 24 hours into the crisis. We were getting pretty cocky. And I hate to say it's cocky when these guys are still stuck in space. But basically, um, our belief, my belief, our belief as a team, was always that give us any problem, that's when we operate best. Steady state operation, we don't want to go around circles, we want to do that stuff. We, we are problem solvers, so give us something that's tough. And basically, that was the mode we carried through to the final end of the mission. Was the splashdown successfully of Apollo 13 the greatest moment? Of your career? There were many greatest moments, and I would say the greatest moment was always the satisfaction at the end of the mission at my team's performance. Because these guys, as I said, Merc Project Mercury is boot camp. Uh, Project Gemini was where basically we became a team, and Apollo was where we executed operations as a team. To me, it was always, it was pride in America. We maintained the high ground of space that we had established very early in the Gemini program. But basically, it was always one of satisfaction that in the nature and the culture that existed within the flight control team. It was always just pure joy that uh, we pulled off another one, and we did it as a team. A lot of the discussion of, of the moon landing seems to have lost the Cold War element mm -hmm. lately. There was some controversy about the flag and the and the first man movie. I don't know if you paid any attention to that. I'm familiar with that. <laughs> but <laughs> how important is it to understand that part of the space race? I was always a Cold War warrior. Uh, basically, I believe that uh, Americans paid for this great expedition we went on. An American president inspired us to do it. American factories, universities, and students graduating from university executed this plan. And uh, when it came time to uh, address this, I addressed this exact issue at the Smithsonian November at Flight Jacket Night. And in uh, Mission Control, when we restored Mission Control, we found some unused 16 millimeter film that had never been showed in any of the movies. It wasn't in Apollo 1, it wasn't the first man, any of that kind of stuff. But it basically showed the teams in mission control solving the problems that allowed us to get down the surface of the moon. Once we got on the surface of the moon, the next slide I have in that slide, movie I have, is a crew planting the American flag. And I think that is essential for America to continue to believe in this dream that we have on our nation. It requires duty, honor, especially sacrifice, but it requires a commitment to an ideal that was set forward in the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, because we are a nation built upon laws, equality for all, and that as a nation, I won't say that we're the traffic cops of the world, but we have great responsibilities to take care of our people and to assist our allies. Where would you like to see the space program go from here? <laughs> 
I would like I would like to see us go back to the moon. But in order to do that, we need to find the leadership to do that. The one thing I didn't talk about in the earlier discussion was the quality of leadership we had. It was interesting, no matter what problem I had or any of the flight directors had, there are people sitting behind us that step forward and say, how can I help you? And that was, this was the nature of leadership at that time. They trusted people to execute a very difficult and risky mission. And as a result of that trust, I think we've got a generation of, of new young leaders. And I think that uh, it was the, the nature of the Apollo program to build and demonstrate and basically establish a leadership culture that is essential within a nation. I think to a great extent, the same leadership culture exists within the military services of our country. And I believe that uh, this may be uh, the greatest uh, outcome, not only the Apollo program, but the work we do in space. But I would like to see us do it. I spoke in front of Senator Cruz and his committee. I said, we need this leadership. We need the unity. We need the teamwork. We need focus. If we have those, give us time. We can do the impossible. Lastly, it, it's kind of interesting how it comes full circle. You talked about how you grew up being fascinated by, you wanted to be Jimmy Doolittle. Yes. Today, <laughs> you're going to receive the Wings of Valor Award inspired by Jimmy Doolittle and the Doolittle Raiders. So what does that mean to you? It's uh, very humbling because I was a uh, young paper boy at that time. And at that time before TV, you'd run along the street saying, read, read all about it, extra, 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 diddle or rage, Japan. And you, people would come out from these apartments, from the house and say, what are you seeing? What's going on right on down the line? I lived in that era. It is, it is, I'm, I'm proud to receive this, but I'm so darn humble. It's incredible because these were warriors. These were courageous people. These were individuals who basically asked of themselves and were willing to make the supreme sacrifice to achieve an objective to protect not only the freedoms that we have in our nation, but basically inspire generations that would follow. And I think this is, uh, this is part of my reason for my love of mission control and the people there. It's really not what I have done but basically what I have brought into being people who are believers in this dream called space. I think Doodle gave us the belief in America that could do the impossible. What America will dare, America will do. Mr. Kranz, we thank you very much for your time with us today. And we thank you so much for the impact you have made on our nation, not only through your military service, but also, of course, with NASA. It's been a true pleasure today, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Gene Kranz, U.S. Air Force veteran, and of course, the legendary flight director and mission control leader <laughs> at NASA. I'm Greg Corumbus, reporting for Veterans Chronicles.